Generation Y, oh what a time to be alive. All this new technology swarmed around you like a moth to an open flame. Christmas came around every year and you'd unwrap something new. A brand new computer, a new game, a new console even. I'm not part of Generation Y, but I sure wish I was. Why would that be? Well, simply because of the console wars. But to talk about the main fundamentals of the console wars, we have to go back to the video game crash of the 1980s. And we have to go even farther back, back to the 1950s. Back in October of 1958, a man named William Higginbotham made one of the first video games. It was a low graphic version of Tennis called Tennis for Two. It was a great thing to create, but no one ever bought it because bought the game because number one, no one had the money to buy it, and second, there's only one made until. Magnavox presents Odyssey, the electronic game of the future. Odyssey easily attaches to any brand TV, black and white or color, to create a closed circuit electronic playground. Odyssey, video game fun, computer keyboard challenge. The entrance to an alternate world of fire-breathing dragons. The one with all the fun. The Fairchild Video Entertainment System at your larger JCPenney. The home entertainment system that never gets old. Plug in a new video card and change the fun. Hey, ball position! Atari Anonymous, it's the problem contagious. The 1970s. The, the 70s was the decade when video games were the top of the game. Graphics and computers has advanced. During this time, a lot of great video games have came out uh, that people still play and talk about, like Pac-Man, Space Invaders, Asteroids, Galaga, and more. Also during this time, the gaming industry and the gaming community was becoming one of the biggest thing out there. In the early 80s, video games started to become more and more poorly made and sold to the public at a high starting price. And different companies, especially Atari, made many game systems in such a short amount of time that made them come out so poorly. For example, in 1980, there was the Atari 2600, the Atari 2500, the Fairchild Ch Channel F system, the Vectrex, the Emerson Arcadia 2001, and a whole lot more. One game in particular was E.T. the Extraterrestrial. This game was the worst game in history, video game history. E.T. was made for Atari 2600 and 1.5 million copies were sold and most of the games came back to the Atari warehouse. Atari was so embarrassed that they took the remaining copies of the E.T. game that hadn't been shipped yet, put it in, the, in a truck, took it out to the middle of a New Mexico desert and dumped the car cartridges into a big landfill. None of the games have been seen since. One of the reasons why it turned out so bad was because one of the short of the short time the game was supposed to be released. E.T. How came out in theaters and became a big hit movie. Atari bargained to get the rights uh, to the game. Once it happened, there was barely any time to get the game ready for the 1982 holiday season, only five and a half weeks. Another game that was made by Atari was Pac-Man, and it's not the Pac-Man that we all know and love made by Namco, but the Atari version. The game was a complete flop, didn't even resemble the original at all. Graphics didn't even resemble the original game, the game was flickery and glitchy, and Pac-Man was a weird UFO looking shape and he has an eye. What retro Pac-Man has an eye? The game that was released as Pac-Man for 2600 was actually the prototype version, not the fully developed version, which is kinda stupid on Atari's part. By 1982, video games were getting cheaper and cheaper. Games that were originally $50 were now $5. Some games were even coming from random products. There was even a case where games were coming from a bag of dog food. Yes, dog food. Different companies that had nothing to do with gaming were putting free gaming games in their product. Then by 1983, the gaming industry lost 90% of all their gross, which made the industry crash. The industry lost a lot. No video games were being made, no systems were being produced, nothing. Just a major plunge for two whole years. But during this time, more people went to their local arcades. Arcades were making a lot of money between 1983 and 1985. In Japan, video games were booming like crazy. They took the lead while American companies had to deal with the crash. In Japan, there was a newcomer in the industry by the name of Nintendo. 
Nintendo had released their first console, the Family Computer, often shortened to Famicom, to massive fanfare. So they thought, why don't we release this in America? Well, after some intensive development, they released the Famicom, known in America as the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES, to great fanfare. Nintendo became a household name practically overnight. The video game market was revived, and Nintendo put measures in place to make sure something like the video game crash never happened again. These measures were panned by critics of the company. Companies even tried getting around these measures. One measure in particular was that companies could only release five games a year, so Atari, yes, that Atari, created a subsidiary called Tengen to combat this, and it worked. Some companies couldn't handle it though, and flocked to other companies such as Sega. This is the Sega Master System, the first system Sega released to try and combat Nintendo. In comparison to the NES, it flopped. The NES sold 62 million units worldwide, yet the Master System only sold 18 million. That means the NES sold about 3.5 times more units than Sega, which gave them a majority of the market share. Now with the framework down, let's talk about Tom Kalinske. Tom Kalinske was a former CEO of various toy companies and was responsible for the revival of Barbie and Matchbox. After the somewhat flop of the Master System, he was brought aboard as the CEO of Sega of America, and with his marketing techniques, Sega soon became a common name. Tom's philosophy was to go into a market where there was no competition, so in other words, he went to the 16-bit market. Soon after the Sega Genesis was released, and with his aggressive ad campaign, the Genesis picked up speed. Danita Stokes, president of HAG. Now, you may be wondering how this connects to taking a stand in history. It's just two consoles manufacturers duking it out, right? Well, Sega took a stand against Nintendo by trying to gain market shares. You see, at the time, Nintendo owned almost all the market, around 90% in fact. So Sega tried to stay alive by developing a new console to battle Nintendo. Now, get Sonic free. Introducing the next generation from Nintendo, New Super Mario World. Nintendo knew about their intentions and developed a 16-bit console, the Super Famicom, dubbed the Super Nintendo Entertainment System stateside. This was the start of the console world. Although the Super Nintendo had the edge of being more powerful, the Genesis had the edge of releasing earlier, meaning that it gained more of a foothold. Sega's market share rose and rose, then Mortal Kombat came along. Super Nintendo, now you're playing with power, super power. Fight. Mortal Kombat was the beginning of the end for Sega. Mortal Kombat was a hit in arcades, so it was decided that the game would be ported to the Super Nintendo and Genesis. Nintendo had censorship measures in place at the time, so the blood was replaced with sweat. Sega, on the other hand, did not, and although the blood was hidden away, it was still there just by entering a cheat code. Eventually, this got the attention of politicians on Capitol Hill. And soon there was a congressional hearing on violence in video games. After the hearings were finished, Congress said that the video game industry needed to check themselves. And so, the Entertainment Software Rating Board, or ESRB, was formed. Sega slowly lost their foothold by trying to prolong the life of the Genesis. There was the Sega CD, the Sega 32X, the Genesis Model 2, the Genesis CDX, the Nomad, and the Genesis Model 3. Just to name a few, most of these failed. The Sega CD was, mild, was a mild success, and so was the Genesis Model 2, but everything else practically changed. The 32X only had 40 games released, and the 6 of those games required to use the Sega CD. The Genesis Model 3 and the Nomad were obscure, you probably haven't even heard of them. Sega soon crumbled and lost their console war to Nintendo. Nowadays, there are many consoles competing, so the consoles were never truly ended. You have the Nintendo Switch coming out in just a couple of weeks, and you also have the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One out. There's many choices, but which to choose? 